So at this point, everyone probably knows that I've been doing the little series of the different levels of beginner, intermediate when it comes to keeping pet snakes. So as per everyone's request, I'm going to do an advanced species list of pet snakes. So when we talk about the level, we're going to get the little minutiae over really quick, I promise. We're talking about the rarity, the level of keeping, the fragility of the snake, the everything that has to do with it, the attitude, the size, all of the things that get into it to make it to where you really need to have had quite a bit of experience working with multiple species of snakes that require different husbandry requirements, as well as individuals that have quite a few differences of behavior and all of the things that go into keeping a pet snake properly and well. So without further ado, let's get right into it. One that I actually really like every single, every single species that belongs to this genus. And this is the Asian red-tailed rat snake or sometimes called the red-tailed racer. Now this is a large species of old world rat snake that has a very large range that goes across quite a bit of Southeast Asia into parts of Indonesia and even the Philippines. Now, they belong to the genus Goniosoma, which also contains species like the rain rat snake and obviously the rhino rat snake. I love every single species of this. I don't usually get into like, I want to be this collector of things, but I really would love to be able to have a pair or trio and work on being able to produce every single species that belongs to the genus that these guys belong to. Now, they get their name for pretty obvious reasons, those tails. Now, they call them the red-tailed rat snake, but I have, and I go through a fair bit of research, watching videos, reading articles, looking at different pictures. When I do these things, I have yet to see a truly, really nice red tail. And in fact, when you think of like the red tails, usually you think of the red tail boas. You know how a lot of them don't have the really nice red tails other than a few really good examples? They're more of kind of like a tan to brown color. Well, that also is kind of the same thing with the red-tailed rat snake. Now, they are very iconically usually quite that bright green, but they do come a couple other colors, including brown, silver, and even a yellow one. But those are found almost exclusively in the Philippines, and since the Philippines doesn't export them out, we're really never going to get them. Now, these guys are a very large rat snake, as I said previously. They can easily achieve six to seven feet long. Typically, the females are a little bit larger, as same with like a lot of the other species, like the rain rat snake, the rhino rat snake. Males usually sit in that four to five and a half-ish foot range. Females can get that six, seven, sometimes eight plus feet long. They are very arboreal. They're more diurnal. They're more of a cathemeral species of snake to where they can be active both the day and the night, just kind of depending on a whole lot of factors, be it temperature, prey abundance, the time of the year. They do go through periods of brumation or uh, they kind of hunker down a little bit, but not nearly as long as say like our American rat snakes, like corn snakes and the Texas rat snakes and stuff that we do here as well. They're fairly arboreal, which means that they really do prefer um, different, uh, they are generalists, but they do prefer birds. They do prefer different species of lizards. And thus brings us to the part where why they are considered advanced. So we, a lot of them, almost all of them are all wild caught animals. And so I've talked about wild animals, wild caught animals a number of times. So many issues with this. Now, every single species, as far as I am aware, that belongs to this genus are a fairly sensitive animal. It takes them a long time to get established and to get them used to all of the different setups. A captive bred animal has a much easier time with that, but even a small baby can sometimes have a very hard time to do that. Even my breeder male rhino rat snake did not want to eat, even though I knew it was an established, already turned colored adult. It took a very long time for him to get settled in, and the same goes with the red-tailed rat snake. So you take an animal that is very stressed from all of the wild caught conditions, and then you try to get them that is already a very flighty, very reactive, very visual defensive snake to get them used to this. Now, there are a couple of YouTubers out there that are fairly well known, like Snakes and Adders, and I believe M Exotic um, are well known for their work with the red tailed rat snakes. Now, if you want to go check them out, they probably go into a little bit more detail than I'm doing this very kind of quick cursory one of this top five list. 
but they are an absolutely amazing species of snake, but they are known to be giant pain in the butts when it comes to just their husbandry and keeping because of their wild-cut animals and their general flighty defensive personality. Keeping with the theme of colubrids, this next one is a new world species of rat snake that is called the tiger rat snake. Now the tiger rat snake belongs to a genus called Spilodes. They are found in Central and South America and they are very large colubrids. These are some of the largest colubrids in the new world up there with the indigos, the crebos, the muserranas, and the false water cobras where some individuals can get up to if not exceeding nine feet in length. These guys are amazing. They're called tiger rat snakes for a pretty obvious reason. Although their pattern and color can vary to be where they can be almost entirely yellow to much more black with just a little bit of yellow on there. A really, really cool species of snake. Now, they are also, just like the Asian, Asian red-tailed rat snakes, they are very arboreal. They're more diurnal, although cathemeral would probably be a much more appropriate thing to describe them as well, where they can be active day and night, just kind of depends on all sorts of the little factors, just as they are. They do like birds, they do like mammals, they do like lizards, they will eat all sorts of stuff. They do move up and down in the canopy, probably a little bit more than the Asian red-tailed rat snakes do. Um, and as I mentioned, they are almost exclusively wild caught. You see a lot of these guys on those big wholesaler tables at um, Reptile Expos for probably four or $500. They are captive bred in small numbers, including in this country, and that's where you'll be paying eight, nine, a thousand, uh, eight, nine hundred, a thousand dollars or more for individuals. They are really cool. Most of the time they're categorized either as Brazilian or as Central American. There are some different localities thrown throughout there. Typically the South American ones are usually a little bit larger, keeping in theme with a lot of our more familiar species of snakes. But this is one that is definitely more of a display type animal, very similar to the red tailed rat snake, where you need kind of a large vivarium or enclosure where you need lots of height because they like to climb, they like to hide, they will bask, they need that humidity, so you need to be able to have all sorts of these things in this very large enclosure to be able to house properly just to keep the animal healthy. And then again, you're dealing with this delicate wild-caught animal full of parasites that is also very flighty and very defensive and is more quicker to react with its bite than it will be to run away than some other species that would be considered more intermediate level. So thus, advanced. Here is a very good example of an advanced species of snake. Now, this is probably the most advanced of the big five constrictors, being the rocks, the Indians, the berms, the retics, and the anacondas. Now, here in the hobby, we essentially have access to two of the four species of anacondas, the yellows and the greens. Now, all anacondas come from South America, typically in central and northern parts of South America, east of the Andes, mostly in the Amazon basin, in countries like Bolivia, Peru, Brazil, and a couple others. Now, the yellow anacondas are the more common and more popular of them for a couple of reasons. Number one, their size, and number two, they weren't typically as heavily regulated, both for exportation and for the ability to have them as the greens are. Now, the yellows, I did say, are smaller, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are a small snake. They're sexually dimorphic, just like the greens are. What are you doing, buddy? So this is Sir Mix-a-Lot, by the way, because I think I'm hilarious. A, even a small male, because male anacondas are much smaller than the female counterparts, even a small yellow male anaconda can still be over seven, eight feet long, with females getting well over 12 feet. With the greens, males can typically get seven to nine feet. Sir Mix-a-Lot is probably sitting around six and a half, close to seven feet. He's been a bit of a pain in the butt when it comes to feeding, and I'll get into that in just a minute with the females obviously being those large, heavy-bodied uh, boas being the largest boa in the world. Now, all boas are semi-aquatic, which means that when we come to keeping them and housing them, we have to keep that in mind. That is very large water sources that they absolutely not only will stay in, will feed in, but defecate in. So that means lots of water changes, keeping that water clean. If it's very large and you live in a colder area, that means you need to keep the water heated and filtered as well. And then lots of room for them to be able to bask because while they will spend a large majority of their time in the water, they absolutely do love to bask and spend time out of the water and thermoregulate that way. Now, in the wild, because that's where a lot of these guys will come from, they love to eat birds. They will eat kind of whatever, 
but they do love birds. And that was actually a big problem for Sir Mixlot here. He came to me only eating chicks. And it wasn't until basically this year that he started to eat rats. And so this is an animal that for the last seven years has only eaten quail and chicks and ducks until just recently started to eat frozen thawed rats. So that is a huge issue when it comes to people being able to get, especially right now, to being able to get ready access to healthy parasite free birds. Now, in addition to all of the housing and the size and everything like that, anacondas are typically considered one of the most advanced species of snakes in general that people can keep assuming that you live in an area, by the way, another thing, that you're legally allowed to have animals that can get that large, is how they react and their body language and their defensiveness. Most snakes have a very atypical way of being defensive. If you work with animal, if you work with really any species of snake for, any period, for an extended period of time, you learn their body language. You can learn when they want to be left alone. Typically, they will make that S'd up shape they will, in the case of, you know, a lapids, they will hood up, they will puff up like the Asian rat tails, they'll kind of puff out their neck. Um, a lot of the hog noses, they will flatten out their neck too. These guys won't necessarily do that. They will try to move and run away from you because they, you know, are like a lot of snakes, despite being even large anacondas or crebos or indigos that are essentially apex predators in themselves, are, are can still be prey items and they are as as young individuals and so they retain that so they do want to be left alone if they think they're going to be harassed but they do not have typical behavior when it comes to letting you know that they're done and in addition to that most snakes will strike forward in the case of some of them when they were raised up they will strike down like cobras these guys can very easily just kind of go off in any direction even backwards where he can be sitting just like this and he can just go straight backwards just like that um, and he has done that. I've never taken a bite from Sir Mixalot before, and I've worked with him for quite a few years now, but he does have a couple tells, and supposedly quite a few anacondas do have this. If you look very closely at the muscles in their neck, you can see them kind of clench and stress their, their muscles, and they will typically go in the direction that they do that. However, I don't know too many people that are actually capable of noticing that and reacting quick enough to be able to catch him doing that. And he also, this guy has a pretty good tell, which is when he is done, he will start to move or to run, um, or he will start moving around a lot more and trying to actually get away from handling. And that usually means that Sir Mixlot is done for the day. And he is starting to move a little bit more than he was before. So we're gonna wrap up this segment and then we'll get on to the next one. But anacondas, even a male anaconda here, very large animal, as you can tell, very powerful, somewhat of an unpredictable nature and defensiveness. And so that makes them ah, an advanced species. Okay, next one. Sorry, Sir Mixlot wears me out. This next one is another colubrid. In fact, almost every one on this list is gonna be a colubrid. And this is the mangrove snakes. So the mangrove snakes, obviously another species that I don't get to work with being here in Colorado where we can't keep rear fanged venomous colubrids. Now, mangrove snakes belong to a genus called Boega. And Boega are made up of mangrove snakes, the cat-eyed snakes, and some tree snakes, although there's lots of different tree snakes. They're all essentially a rear fang venomous snake. Most of them are quite nocturnal. Most of them are quite arboreal. And a lot of them are found in parts of Southeast Asia, including the essentially the most common one, the golden or the gold crowned or the black and yellow mangrove tree snake, or the mangrove snake, where I will put the scientific name right here as always, because I'm not going to mangle that. All of Boyega are fairly arboreal. They are generous. They will they eat birds. They will eat reptiles. They will eat small mammals. But they are very reactive, very defensive, very striky snakes. This is one that I would classify as the most display of any of the animals that I listed today. They are a very beautiful species of snake where the amount of black and yellow can vary. And there are plenty of other boyga out there. I'm just sticking with the most popular one. They are very beautiful snakes, but they are a very, in general, hands-off species of snake. Um, the pattern obviously is very reminiscent of other species out there like the Bolens pythons, the tiger rat snakes, um, and even the Russian rat snakes. But all of those are probably, with the exception of the Bolens python, probably a little bit of a easier thing to get a hold of. 
Um, as far as the rear fang venom goes, there's never, as far as I could tell, ever been a true hospitalization or medically significant bite from them. Um, but they are known, colloquially anyway, to be, have a little bit more of a potent venom to humans. And so you really don't want to take a bite from a mangrove snake. I have noticed they are starting to grow in popularity quite a bit, probably as a result of several other very well-known uh, reptile pet tubers or influencers. And again, we won't mention any names. Um, they too have ponytails as well. Uh, but I don't know if that's necessarily the best thing or not. Again, I'm not really one to sit there and say that you really shouldn't own this animal or this animal unless there's a real significant reason why you shouldn't. You know, like a Komodo dragon probably shouldn't own just because of the legality of it. Large constrictors, most people don't have the ability to take care of them very properly. Um, with the Boega, if you live in an area to where you are allowed to legally have them, if you have quite a bit of experience with them, I think that this is one that you necessarily wouldn't have too many issues with. Um, they are a mostly wild-caught animal, just like really every animal on this list today. They are, again, starting to be more popular. They are starting to be bred more in captivity, so your odds of getting a much more settled and established baby that's feeding really well probably on mammals are much more likely than even like the tiger rat snake um, and things like that. However, again, fairly hands off when it comes to the um, habitat that you need to keep them in. They're from Southeast Asia, different islands like the Philippines and Guam and areas like that. Um, actually, not Guam. We don't, we don't, you know, we, we don't want to talk about the boy on, on Guam. Um, so we're talking high humidity, decent basking spot, not real high because they are more nocturnal, but you still want to give them the thermal gradient. Plenty of height to move around in and out and up and down in that vivarium. Really cool species of snake. Not as I'm not quite as knowledgeable about these guys, but they are still an amazing species of snake if you're able to keep them, if given enough research and experience with them. Last on the list, another species of colubrid. And actually, this is another member of the Spilodes genus. This is the Amazon puffing snake or the Amazon yellow puffing snake, sometimes called the chicken snake, although... Also, the tiger rat snake is sometimes called the chicken snake, too. And also, sometimes bull snakes are called chicken snakes. I don't know. People are weird. That's why I don't really like the common names thing. But the Amazon puffing snake is another member of Spilodes. Obviously, a very large colubrid, just like the tiger rat snake. They can sometimes reach upwards of nine feet long. So, again, some of the largest colubrids in the New World. They're called the Amazon puffing snakes because they come from parts of northern South America. They are fairly arboreal, just like the tiger rat snakes. And they get their name puffing for a pretty obvious reason. This is their defense display. Defense display. Ah. So they will S up like a lot of species of snake will. They will hiss sometimes just like a lot of species of snakes will. But unlike the tiger rat snake or vine snakes, they don't flatten out. They will puff up. And you know, the red tail rat snake does kind of puff a little bit. It does S up. Some other snakes will kind of puff up a little bit. But this looks like someone filled a balloon up like right below their jaw and just went mm -mm 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 and blew them up. They are really, really interesting and really cool species of snakes. Now, the interesting thing about these guys is that they are, in fact, rear fanged venomous. Other species in the genus Spilodes, like the tiger rat snake, aren't as far as we are aware, and we've been keeping them for quite a long time, so we would probably know by this point, but the Amazon puffing snakes are. And, interestingly enough, they have some very unusual venom. So, just like other rear fang venomous snakes, they don't have the typical front-facing uh, fangs, either fixed or adjustable, like vipers and elapids. They're at the back, it grooves down, it's a little bit more of a primitive delivery method. But... These guys, their bite is interesting where there are actually separate toxins that are essentially prey specific, where one toxin in their venom greatly affects birds and lizards, and it doesn't really affect mammals, even at higher doses that would be very lethal to birds and lizards are essentially unaffected by mammals. And then they have a toxin that is much more effective on mammals, specifically rodents, than they do the birds and reptiles. It's essentially the inverse of that first one. So it's a very interesting species of snake, and it's a very interesting thing about them. 
Now, keeping them is very similar to that of the tiger rat snake, where you want to give them plenty of space. They do like to climb because they're fairly arboreal. They can be picky eaters, just like the tiger rat snake. Although, based on what I have seen and talked to a couple different people, they seem to actually be able to adapt to handling a little bit easier and a little bit more readily than the tiger rat snake does. They don't usually have as striking colorations as them, but they have a couple of those really weird adaptations that make them a very unusual and a very unique species to keep. Being a large snake, being a flighty snake, being a reactive snake, and being a rear fang venomous snake, it's definitely one that is much more at an advanced level of keeping that you do want plenty of experience and knowledge and research before getting into. So hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video. There are plenty of other snakes out there for a many a reasons. There's uh, only really reason why I only mentioned one of the giant ones because we've talked at length about why keeping giant snakes is a much more advanced thing than people would ever lead you to believe. Um, although a lot more people are very more upfront about that than they were even a couple years ago. I didn't mention actual ven a actual. I didn't mention vipers or lapids really at all because again they're in this whole other thing that we've talked about. And I didn't really mention crocodilians because this is a snake specific one, but. In general, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Advanced keeping, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that and I highly recommend anybody that is absolutely, truly dedicated and interested and loves and is passionate about these animals. There's absolutely nothing wrong with keeping any of these more advanced species as long as you're doing the best for them, doing all of your research and doing the best to learn about these guys, which absolutely means more than watching just this video alone. Hopefully, again, you guys enjoyed today's video. If you can, like and subscribe, hit the bell notification. I have a whole playlist of the top five videos. If you guys want to be able to help me support me a little bit more, I do have a Patreon. There's all sorts of different varying levels in there from a dollar onward up with different uh, rewards like uh, wristbands, private tours virtually, uh, discounts on merch, early access, your name mentioned in the credits because I absolutely do support, uh, love, and appreciate your support. Again, and I will uh, mention this again. I haven't mentioned it for the last few videos. If you guys do love this kind of content, please like, subscribe, and then share with your friends. I'm doing my best. I, wanted, would, I would love to be able to do this entirely full time and be able to support this, but these guys are very expensive. So in an effort to get more subscribers on YouTube to kind of help with that whole monetization thing, at 5,000 subscribers, I'm going to do a full property tour, which means this full building that I haven't really shown off very much, then the other room that I have where I keep my cooler weather uh, old world rat snakes and geckos, as well as the rest of the property, like the pond and all of the livestock that I have as well. And I will do the full property tour. And then for 10,000 subscribers, we'll do an animal giveaway where we'll have a little lottery, everyone can enter in. You'll get that and actually send off an animal from Jay-Z's reptiles. So if you can, Thank you so much. Like, subscribe, share, subscribe, all those little fun things that we can do. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, want to see anything else for any other videos, let me down, uh, down below. Email me, other social media, yada, yada, yada. Hope everyone's having a great day. I'll check you next time.